Hello, and welcome to Not Your Grandma's Attic, the cod blah, 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 The Codcast. Where we, the Codcast, the true crime podcast where we talk about things all true crime here in the year 2021. I am your co-host, Kat. And I'm your co-host, Caleb. And today we will be discussing a book that I found um, at a bookstore in a free bin. It was just like, it's like one of those um, bookstores where they just have like a big box outside mm-hmm. that's just like free books, I guess, that they think they can't sell. And uh, I picked this up because the cover is hilarious, to me anyway. Um, and it is uh, a serenade saga, an inspirational romance <laughs> called Juliana of Clover Hill How exciting. by Brenda Knight Graham. Um, so when I picked this book up, I had in the back of my mind <laughs> the promise I made to not do any more romance novels um, for a while. And well, it, it has seems been like a while. not that long. Now. Yeah, it's been a few months, but I was thinking like never again. <laughs> but the, it just intrigued me and it was free and I'm just like, oh, I can't turn this up. Or tur- sorry, turn this down the exact opposite of what I said. I can't turn this up. <laughs> so uh, <Turn laughs> when up. I upload this, turn it up. So... Um, we'll just get started because this is going to take, this is going to take a minute. I took a lot of notes on this because this, I'm not going to give my opinion on this yet, but let's just, uh, say that this book is a product of its time. (laughs) All right. So we're just going to get in it. I'm going to set this up for you. Okay. So uh, also this book was written in 1984. So we all know what that means. Uh, the communists. The communists. Censorship. All right. So here's the backstory. We're in Georgia, in Habersham County, in 1919. Where is Habersham County? Picture it. It is where Helen is located. It's like kind of the middle northern part of Georgia. So not where I'm from. No one cares about. (laughs) It is pretty up there. Okay, so it's not like where I'm from because I'm from like towards like the um, Tennessee Chattanooga area. This is like a little bit farther east than that. So, but it's like, uh, it's a lot closer to the Blue Ridge Mountains. Stuff like that. So, um, so if you've ever been to Helen, Georgia, anyway, um, and we open to, there are a lot of characters introduced in this first chapter. So I just went ahead and made a list. Okay. We're introduced first to Juliana. She is, as indicated by the title, our main character um and she is going out to get the mail and through this brilliant use of just exposition basically anytime juliana looks at something it just reminds her of something else so we get backstory on her so the backstory is basically it's 1919 her father died from an i think an ulcerated stomach that sounds painful yeah yeah, like right before the flu epidemic, which is a little bit fitting. So <laughs> maybe this novel um, is so, predicting our current time. I mean, kind of, kind of a little bit. I hope not. <laughs> but <laughs> so basically, dad died. They work on a farm. Multiple times they talk about the farm growing different things. However, I think in the year 1919 they grow mostly apples. So they are apple farmers in. Habersham County, Georgia, 1919. Dad's dead. Everyone gets super sick with the flu. One of the brothers is off at the war, but it's said that he never actually got shipped off to Europe before the war ended because he got the flu and almost died. And so that brother is Henry. So we have Juliana, Henry, who is the brother and a farmer. Uh, We learn that he is... um, he. Okay, so I think he is older... He's definitely older than, um, what's her face? Fuck. Juliana, whatever the fuck her name is. I already forgot her name. (laughs) (laughs) She's called multiple things in this book. (laughs) Okay. Juliana Judy is is her nickname. So, (laughs) her. And, okay. So, he's older than her. I'm not 100% sure which order he is, but he's older than her. And he was, he was forced to drop out in eighth grade by their dad to go and work on the farm. So he's like a farmhand, and what he would really like to do is go out west. But he feels like now that dad's dead, and he's come back from the war, he's got to be the man of the house or whatever. And I think he's at like least early 20s at this point. Um, um, we have Maud. This is Henry's horse, 
previously Papa's horse. So important to know. Um, it's like the important farm horse. So the we horse have is Mama. important. Not super important, okay. but it everything has a fucking name in this, and they're all like superhuman names, and it's so confusing. Also, a ton of people have multiple names that they get referred to throughout the book as, and it's very annoying. So, <laughs> Maud, Henry, Juliana, Papa, dead. Mama is the mother. Okay, um, good to know. She is still alive. Okay, Six not dead. children, including, including Juliana and henry we have richard he's their older oldest brother maybe no i think he's the second son i think henry's the third son richard is the second son originally i thought that he was the first son and we'll get to that um he's not super important to this uh francis that is richard's wife also not important um we have baby jack and also there's another little girl whose name I don't remember. Um, it's something. Her, her its name is something. Uh, it doesn't name matter. Is something. <laughs> What's important <laughs> is that they have babies. Okay, Calvin. I realized by about the middle of the book that this is the oldest brother. Mm. It's very confusing because in the first chapter they keep talking about Cal. They're like calvin but we always call him brother and so i was assuming like oh this is like a family friend that for some reason you call him brother and it's capitalized brother each time yeah so it's like oh okay but no this is actually their older brother and calvin aka brother um is married to winnie and he also has two kids um that's also brother is important winnie less so okay. um grange Grange is a friend of the family, and we learn at some point in the book, don't remember where, it doesn't matter where, because it's not super important, but basically he had run away from Georgia Tech and his responsibilities, which one, like, number one, like, mood. <laughs> but, like, so, but anyway, so they kind of, like, took him under their wing. Um, also, that's Mama's, like, one main character trait, is that she likes to take in people that... Uh, need help. That's like that's like her whole thing. Okay, good for her. Okay, so 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 far we have Juliana, Henry, Richard, and Calvin. Those are the those are four of the siblings. We also have sister, whose real name gets mentioned exactly one time, and it's Emily. Um, but otherwise, she is only referred to as sister, capital S sister. But unlike brother, she never gets a reason for why she's called that. Like brother, it said, it said like we've just always called him that. Even Mama calls him that. But everyone just calls her sister for like no reason. I don't know why. So <laughs> this is very important. You need to keep all these names. That's why I'm spending so much time on this. Okay. <laughs> Juliana, Henry, Richard, Calvin slash brother, um, fuck sister slash Emily. Uh, she's 20 and a school teacher and then byron he is two years older than juliana and his character's trait is that he is smart an artist and shy so from there we also have molly so molly is grange's wife okay and grange is the um he's the family friend that for Georgia Tech and all that garbage, right? So that's her wife. And um, no one likes Molly except for Grange. She gets described as... Well, first they're like, she's so sick. And she's just always sick. And it's like, okay, well, I mean, that's not really like her fault. <laughs> they and hate so, her she's <laughs> a sick bitch. She's sick. And it's mentioned, it's mentioned like multiple times throughout the book. It's like, yeah, we don't know how much longer she's going to last. But everyone just fucking hates her. <laughs> <laughs> and they're so fucking mean to her. Like, I'm kind of like, I kind of feel bad for Molly. No wonder she's like a little bit of a, like a bitch because like everyone's so fucking mean to her. But anyway, um, Grange married Molly and Juliana doesn't feel super great. We learn all this like in the first couple pages. That's why it's like, that's why it's happening like right now. Um, uh, she's sick and she's currently living with um, Mama, Byron, Juliana, and sister. Those are the three kids left at home. Um, and then... Also Molly, because she's sick and 
Grange is off in, I think, like, I think he's off in Atlanta doing some shit. I don't remember exactly. He's working or something. Okay. So, and she's staying there, and none of them like them, but Mama is super nice and let her stay. Okay. Um, Mr. Okay. Well, well, we'll get to the other ones. We're going to get there. But those are our main cast. Two brothers live away from home. Um, two brothers are back home. Henry's come back from the war. Byron is still a teenager. And then there's Juliana, who's the youngest. And then there is um, sister, who's 20 and a school teacher. Okay. Gotcha. 1919. War ended. Everyone almost died from the flu, but everyone's better now. And it's after the war and things are just starting to get a little bit more chill. So Juliana goes out to get the mail. So as she's reading through the mail, she's just she's mentioning, name dropping all these people. That's why we got to get out of the way now. She sees. Um, and so the best way to describe Juliana, let me I have a quote here for you. This is from page eight. What indeed was she expecting? How could she explain that she had no earthly idea? That she was just expecting, capital S, something to capital H happen. Also, I'd like to say there's a lot of weird words capitalized in this book. And it's really annoying. <laughs> um, at 15, her whole body ached with awareness. What does I that I hate mean? that word. I don't fucking know. Um, her, at 15, her whole body ached with awareness. The songs of the... Wait, okay. So this is going to be a long one. You're going to have to bear with me because I had to go through this. So y'all have to get a taste of it. But... <laughs> Cat likes the to songs make people would... suffer with her. I literally... Okay, so I read this book last week. I kind of like just... I didn't like read, read it. I kind of like skimmed through to get a good idea if I like actually wanted to read it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh yeah, that's fine. It's only like, what, 200 pages or whatever? And um, yeah, it's like barely... It's not quite 200 pages. And I got to the end of it. And I was like, yeah, that'll be fine. And then I spent four hours today taking notes on this. Because <laughs> I was just like... I don't know what to do. Like, I just I keep having to break it down and look up things. Anyway. Okay. So, um, at 15, her whole body ached with awareness. The songs of wood thrush, warbler, and mockingbird. The stirring of a warm breeze that dipped up, up under her wide hat and brushed her hot cheeks. The, tra the crackling of seed pods exploding in the August heat along the roadside. The steaming green smell of last night's rain evaporating from dogwood, pine, and rich acres of corn. Well, um, the author is certainly descriptive. Yeah, so the whole book is like this. <laughs> and it's annoying. <laughs> it's like it's like they read Walt Whitman but didn't realize that like the repetition and the um the descriptions of things like had a reason and they were being used in like a specific way. Which I should also mention here, before I start bashing the author, um I've looked up the author. She seems like a really sweet lady. You can find her website at brendanightgram.com. Um, she's just a nice Christian older lady. I think she's like in her 80s now. So I'm not hating on her. I just don't like this book. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> she is not malicious in anything she has done. So, also, if you go to her website, um, on her About page, there are two responses in About. One from Dick Houston on March 11th, 2018. He says, Greetings, Brenda. I need to correct something I said. Dot tells me that Penny and Mike Davis and several others have been by to see us. It appears my memory is not reconstructing as it once did. I'm very sorry for the error, but when others have been by and I don't remember, I hope I can always remember your kind visit. Oh. And very, and very important servant of the Christ, Dick. <laughs> and then Brenda said, the important thing is that you do remember now. Lots of people love you and Dot, and I'm hoping you realize that always. Let's see, she's so sweet. And she's got like a whole like little blog here where she talks about like um, baking bread. Oh, this one's new. I hadn't even seen this one yet. Oh, it's an Oh my goodness, blog. I'm going to have to read this one. An updated blog. Yeah, she update, updates the thing. She posted one on my birthday that I actually read on my birthday about her new cat. And she posts a little picture of the cat. If you scroll, if you click on, if you go to the website, here, I'll send you a link. If you go to the website and um, look in January 2021, you can see the cat. It's very cute. So, like, she's, like, in her 80s. I think she's, like, 79 or 80 or something. She's, like, still going and writing in her little blog and 
everything. It's like, oh, that's so cute. So I'm hating on her book, but she's probably okay. I don't know. She might be a Nazi. You can't tell these days, but. <laughs> I doubt she's a Nazi. I'm not Ooh. saying she is. Don't sue me, Brenda, okay? Allegedly a Nazi. <laughs> See, she's just a nice little Christian lady. So everyone, while you're listening to this, go to her website, get her some views, put some nice comments. Don't put anything mean. And don't put anything about this book if you didn't like my re- like my discussion of it here and my telling of the plot. If you don't like it, you know, just leave her alone. She's good. She's a happy you know, she seems happy. Lots of pictures of plants. Just so sweet. Okay. Anyway. Don't harass any um, of the people that we talk about on this podcast unless we tell you to. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> have we have we had anyone that we wanted to have harassed so far? Uh Oh, maybe that one guy that did the anti-communist one. Yeah, him. Harass him. Harass, uh, harass the guy who did the anti uh, the 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 fucking propaganda documentary. Agenda. Yeah, the one Agenda, about how that's what it's Yeah. Called. Yeah, agenda. Sorry, it's been months even... since we recorded that. <laughs> <laughs> if I think of any other ones that you can harass, I'll let y'all know. Okay. <laughs> Maybe Nostradamus, but just make sure you don't get fucking shot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's how this whole book is written. Lots of descriptions of nature. I think our girl likes nature. You know what? That's really great. I like nature too, but uh, it was really boring to read. So, anyway, we continue. So, all of that to say, she gets the mail, throws it, like, throws, uh, Molly has a letter from Grange, which is the friend, and Molly's his wife. Yes. Throws her the letter, whatever, and they're like, okay, bitches, you gotta come to dinner. So they all sit down for dinner, and they're all making fun of Molly because she's so freaking slow and overweight, this stupid, sick bitch. God damn it. Why is she like this? <laughs> damn. Um... <laughs> And and Juliana thinks about how she's not good enough for Grange, and she's thinking, not because I wanted him, no, because she's no Grange since she was like a little kid, and Grange basically thinks of her like a little sister, so that's basically their relationship, okay. just to spoil a little bit. Anyway, um, we get the thrilling story of how Papa connected their two houses, so there were like two houses on the property, one was built by his dad, anyway... Whatever, there's this thrilling story about Papa and Mama, and if if you really want to read it, if you want to know that thrilling story, you can look it up because it's not that interesting. Um, But we do learn that that they're in Habersham County then, and that Papa was the first man to grow winter grass in this county. Wow. I don't know what winter grass is, but... That um, probably made him a millionaire, right? No, they're fucking poor. So, Uh, like, I think the point of this... I've found myself overanalyzing, like, because generally when you read a book, you want it. Okay, when I read a book, I look for what does this mean within the story? And so, like, Juliana growing up in a poor farmhouse, I figured this was going to play into the plot because, like, you know, every, uh, you know, Papa built it by himself um, without help, you know, and then he only had the one son, Henry, that was there during the day because the rest of them were forced, like, Papa was super big on everyone going to school except for Henry, so I kind of feel bad for Henry, but... Poor Henry. Yeah, fucking Henry got, like, the bad fucking deal. And also, he was the third son. Wouldn't you think it'd be the first son that would have to do that? Well, anyway, you know... I don't know. The third son, he had the bad grades. You know, there He's was no hope for him. Point. I mean, he was only in eighth grade, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> when he was forced to drop out but so basically the point of that story is that they are kind of poor you know they built this house themselves they built all of they built this farm up themselves you know they get by on their means they don't take out credit or debts or anything and like um you know everyone everyone's super happy and they talk about how every house had or every room in the house at one point had been a bedroom and later in the book they talk about how the living room is also a bedroom like there's a bed in there and stuff I think that's where Mama might sleep. I'm not 100 percent sure, but like, they aren't super rich. Is basically yeah. the the gist of that. Doesn't it? You s- think it would be important, but it's not. Doesn't it <laughs> say a lot about society that back in the day when you were poor, you built your own house, but nowadays, if you're rich, you build your own house. Think about it. Uh, well, I mean, they pay <laughs> poor people to build it for them, but well, <laughs> you know what I meant. <laughs> it was a bit okay. okay. <laughs> Actually, there is 
a plot. De- there is something in the plot that relies on them being poor, so I take that back now. But anyway, thrilling story. Okay, so we find out the letter from Grange to Molly is asking if Byron will come up to Clarksville with them. Because I think, so um, Grange is coming up to Helen from Atlanta, and then from there they want to go to Clarksville. Um, he so he he and Molly were already planning to go to Clarksville, but Mr. Kirk, who are they are going to visit, um, and his aunt have invited them to um, bring Byron along because Mr. Kirk is a world-renowned artist, and um, he wants to show Byron around. And as you might remember, Byron, the seventeen-year-old, um, so yes, Juliana. So yeah, yeah, he is he is seventeen. Yeah, because she's she's fifteen. Um, he is into art and poetry. That's kind of like his he's thing. The he's emo like kid. a smart kid or whatever. Yeah. He, well, he's not really emo. He's just smart is his thing. Mm. That's like his, his, that's his dealio. He wants to go to college. He wants to be a fucking fancy pants motherfucker. Okay. And they want him to come with. And then Byron's like, mm, well, I'm not going unless Juliana goes. And Juliana's like, oh, this is because you're shy. Your third character trait. So I will go. And so Molly's like, um, you can't go. You weren't invited. Which honestly, like Molly, I kind of feel you. They weren't invited. So I don't think they should go. Like, uh, not they. She wasn't invited. Anyway, pisses me off that they're so mean to Molly. Even though maybe she has social anxiety. You don't know. Anyway, so. um, And then... We have this really interesting conversation. Okay, I'm not going to spend a whole long time in this, but Molly calls um, the um, the aunt um, an old maid, and then the mother corrects her and says, "Don't you mean spinster?" And it's like, wait, is spinster a better word? And so then I was like, I need to understand like the etymology of spinster and like how it has evolved over the years. Because mm-hmm. this book was written in the 80s and I'm in the 2020s. And then this is supposed to be taking place in 1919. So like I need to understand. And so I looked it up and spinster, it looks like around the 80s was reclaimed by feminists. So um, as we will learn in this book, uh, Brenda is not a feminist, so uh, I don't think that's her reason for using that. To be fair, I don't think there were a lot of those back then. At least l- in the eighties. Hmm. In the eighties. Oh, is this? They in had the a 80s? lot of them back in the eighties. Uh, no, this takes place in the twenties, but she wrote this in eighty four. Oh, I got you. I thought you published it in eighty four. The context of the book. Oh, that's true too. Well, now I don't. Sh- now I'm not sure. I realize I made a bad connection there. <laughs> okay. Well, now I don't know. Anyway, I thought that was really weird. I, maybe at one point, Spencer meant something. So Who knows? Let's see. So, Mr. Kirk, we learned that he's an artist, and all the girls, they trying to be with Mr. Kirk, because he's hot. He's tall. He wears khakis. They want him. Um, and Grange wants to encourage Byron's art, so he asks if he can come. Molly's pissed off about this. We learned that Byron said that he wants to be a minister. Um, and so... Henry brings this up. That's the older brother from the war. And he's like, well, maybe I want to be an artist. I don't know, bro. And Henry's like, I'll think about it. I don't know if I want Molly to go because you guys shouldn't be traveling on a Sunday and like all this stuff. And they're just like, you're just And mama's like, I think they should go. It would be really nice or whatever. <laughs> um, we also learn here that Foster Kirk is a Christian. <gasps> so, but... And also, we see here that Molly is suspicious of Juliana's intentions because she's like looking at her, like, mm, "Yeah, you want to go see this man?" Mm-mm-mm. Okay, um, okay. So, uh, more thrilling details. Um, Henry is angry. Yeah, that they're traveling on a Sunday. I already said that one. Clover Hill. Um, they used to raise cows, but now they mostly grow apples. I don't really know how you make such a transition. Um, because don't apple trees take a while to um grow i don't know anything don't about know. apple trees don't. but i would assume yes i mean i assume most trees take a while to grow but yeah so anyway um but then before that they grew winter grass so there's been a lot of things that have happened on this farm but right now apples um and so they travel from clover hill to clarksville and at the train station, she meets Mr. Kirk for the first time. And I will read a quick excerpt for you. Then, as Grange said something to him, Mr. Kirk glanced up at her. 
For a moment, her heart seemed to stop completely. She lost awareness of the conductor's hand under her elbow, of the buzzing crowd of passengers of Grange and Molly looking up at her quizzically, of Byron pushing, sorry, ugh, of Byron crushing the brim of his hat in his hands behind her. Foster Cook, Cook's eye. Are you okay? No. Foster Kirk's eyes held hers for an eternal moment, laughing, serious, questioning eyes. She could not look away. If it were possible for someone to scowl and smile at the same time, he was doing it in his dark mustache, twitched just slightly. Why did it seem that if she had seen him before, and as if he were teasing her about it? Um, I don't know what's up with this whole thing about him seeing her before, because it comes up again, and it never means anything, but I thought I mentioned that. So... You know, she is into Mr. Kirk. And so at this point, we're assuming that um, she's assuming that he's around the same age as Grange, who's 25. And she's 15. Mm -hmm. And Grange is 25. And we think Mr. Kirk is 25. So we're already in like sus territory, like kind of like, mm, maybe not, you know? Yeah. So we go to Pinedale. This is where Kirk lives. Uh, Molly asks about his family and all these questions. And he's talking about how he's just so attached to Pinedale. And it's just so great. And that's why he moved from the big city of Chicago to come down here to Georgia. Oh, wow. It's just so great. Anyway, it's a much nicer house than theirs. Um, and we meet Aunt D. Her name is Delia Sweet. And she is a bitch. She is a complete <laughs> bitch. God damn. So, like, like, they're all eating dinner together. And, like, she and, you know, Juliana doesn't really like mushrooms, so she kind of just gets, like, a little bit. And, and Aunt Dee's just like, no, you. She's like, oh, no, get some more, get some more. And they're just, she's like, okay. And she gets more, eats it all like a fucking champ. And then Aunt Dee's like, oh, you liked it so much, eat more. It's like she could tell she doesn't like it, so she's supposed to be a bitch about it. <laughs> um, Aunt Dee, why are you such a bitch? Maybe because she's the extra guest, but it's not really Juliana's fault because she's 15. <laughs> anyway, Foster doesn't think that the League of Nations will work because that's Jesus's job. So good to know to to bring peace on the earth. Because you, you remember, this is right after World War One. Um, we learn a lot about Foster's political beliefs in this for some reason, mm -hmm. and only his, not anybody else's. But anyway, Molly is a bitch. That um, oh. I just wrote that wrong. Not Molly is a bitch. Freaking Aunt D is a bitch. They're both bitches. Poor Molly They're can't both... get a break. It's really interesting. All of the women in this book, er, all the main women in this book, unless they are her sister or her mother, complete bitches. So just, just want to say. But, um, and are also jealous of her in certain ways. So mm, anyway, um, Kurt keeps looking at her and she feels uncomfortable and there are five cats under the table i was so excited and they're all auntie's cats <laughs> so they go to look at <laughs> so they go upstairs they go to look at kirk's studio and molly is a bitch and she yells at juliana for looking inside kirk's bedroom and they're just like it's kirk's like no it's fine chill out bro and then they head out and they touch chalk and then they go out and they're hanging out in the yard and grange makes a comment like oh don't you see how much you're missing out on by not having children and he's talking <laughs> about juliana and byron who are children <laughs> and um kirk is just kind of like oh yeah whatever and so you know and then they leave and on the way back juliana asks how old kirk is and grange looks at her and sharply says what you know what concern of that is what of this is to you yeah what concern of that is to you yeah um so we cut to juliana is chilling out in the woods thinking about foster as you might imagine mm -hmm. and um there's this long thing about death and whether she believes in heaven and eternity we're getting more into the christian stuff here um it was pretty boring so i didn't include any of it but this is a really big part of her character, and I guess it's supposed to kind of show that, like, she's been through a lot, even at 15. So, any comments on World War I or um, the flu epidemic of 1918? Uh, that was a bad time. <clears throat> Uncool. Not a great time for humans to be around. Yeah, kind of sucked. Um, so, she runs into Blake... Davis. Mm -hmm. So, um, our girl Brenda does not have very nice words about Blake Davis. So, 
There are so many characters in this book. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) right? (laughs) It fucking sucks. (laughs) That's why that's why I knew when I started this. Like, cause I skimmed through it before and I couldn't keep any of the names straight. And so I was like, I have to write them down. Like I can't, (laughs) I can't keep, I need a place to reference these. So Blake Davis, um, he is introduced as the middle son of Mrs. Davis, a thrilling title, but, um, he's, um, he's her mentally disabled son, but they use a much less, um, nice term about him in this book. And throughout the book referred to him as a nitwit. (laughs) Um, so... (laughs) Um, I guess maybe nitwit had a different meaning back then. Now, when I think of nitwit, I think of my mom, like, hitting me with a magazine because I, like, did something dumb as a kid. (laughs) But they also use the not great word, the R word on him. And I'm not going to say that one, but yeah, so they say that. And it was in the 80s. Yeah, back then that word was, you know, it wasn't a slur back then. So I'm not going to say it, but it is there. Read at your discretion. So, um... And she runs into him, and she's like, and he tries to scare her with a dead snake, and she's just like, Blake, you silly goose, <laughs> and, t- and takes him back home. Or no, she takes uh, the Davises live right next to him, so she takes him back to her house for some like lunch or whatever, because they're because he's just like she's grown up with him, and she's just like, oh, you're just messing with me, you know, whatever. They're like the same age or whatever. So anyway, um, she gets a letter from grange and she's kind of like and inside of it there are two pieces of paper one from foster and one from grange so um in a quote from the so foster wrote to grange and then grange wrote another letter to juliana and then sent both of them to her if that makes sense and a quote from foster's letter is grange do you think i might gain the privilege of painting that little darned piece or that darned little scrap of nothing you brought with you <laughs> And so she gets pissed off at this because she just got a called a darned little scrap of nothing. <laughs> yeah, I'd be pissed off too. And then um, Grange writes her a letter, and I'm gonna read a little excerpt from that. Let's see. Uh, uh, so just as a heads up, I just looked down and realized that Audacity says I have one hour of um, recording disk space left. So. Oh shit! I only have an hour. <laughs> just, better start just as a heads up better start deleting shit <laughs> anyway she gets a letter and he's like y'all should get this painting done whatever and everyone's pissed off about it but mama's like i think you should do it also sister refers to it as pine land even though it's definitely pine dale so <laughs> typo so um it is finally determined that she will go she goes with sister we meet beppo or Beepo. I like Beepo. That does sound but better. But it's B-E-P-P-O. I think yeah. it's Beppo, but I want to call him Beepo because it's funny. So um, that's his badly behaved dog. And then we're also introduced to Maureen, another fucking character. And she's a fucking city girl. She has a white poodle named Serena. And she's interested in Kirk. And, um, and she's just like, why is this Juliana girl back again? And he's just like... Um, because she's come to see my studio. And she's like, she already saw your studio. And then he just kind of like brushes her off. So anyway, they go, they get the, um, uh, auntie is rude to her. They find out she has 10 cats. 10 cats. And she usually has 12, (laughs) but two of them were given away because they're kittens. Anyway. Um, so he starts painting her. Also, I'm not, I'm not sure if he does talk drawings or paintings. doesn't really matter. Anyway, she wants to read Jane Eyre, whatever. So she finds out he was two years old when they moved to this house in 1888. So that means he is currently 32. Hmm. Yeah. 32 or 31. So just, you know, whatever. He's 32, 31, painting her. It's all good. All good. Um, Normal. She thinks... Wait, well, how old know. is she I again? Mean, she's 15. Okay, yeah. But also consider at this point, she's 15, but we just, we all, the only thing we know is that she's into him. So this is just kind of like a teenage crush at this point. So a lot can happen between now and the end of the book. <laughs> um, You know, maybe she'll find someone that's not 32. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't read the book, so. I um, haven't read the book as read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, twice (laughs) so she has the thought that she feels like she knows kirk better than her brothers Mm -hmm. she's met this man twice and both times never spoken to him one-on-one 
<laughs> other than about Jane Eyre. And then um, he treats you know, her like men a love lady. to talk about Jane Eyre. Oh, they do. He well, he's educated. Uh. So anyway, um, so Mama decides to send. Oh, so we go. She goes back home. Whatever. She needs to go back the next week, but everyone's busy, and Mama's like, she's gonna go by herself. And y'all are just gonna have to fucking deal with it. And Henry's pissed about it, as usual. Because Henry's like, I think he has other intentions with her. And Juliana's <laughs> like, What intentions? Because she doesn't know what sex is, because she's fifteen, I guess. So she's very she is extremely confused by these comments from everybody else. So <laughs> um anyway, um so then we switch to Foster Kirk's perspective. Okay. So So it's um, a different perspective book. So we started out kind of Julian. It's all in third person, but it's all from Juliana's perspective. And then we switch to Foster's perspective. Okay. For just like part of a chapter. Ah, uh, that makes sense. We don't this. This happens in <laughs> all of two times: once with Foster and once with Mama. But anyway, he talks about why he hates Maureen. <laughs> um, because she's just a dumb city bitch. <laughs> so like, fuck her. He, he could never love her. However, needs, he does give. He needs him a church girl. But he also shares his thoughts about um, Juliana. Oh, no. Which are. <laughs> oh, I hate my life. It seemed impossible that after all these years that the girl of his dreams had actually materialized. Oh, no. Yet she had, yet she had come with all the spontaneity, graciousness, and natural beauty and depth of feeling that he could have ever longed for in a companion. Depth of okay. feeling. Foster. You've met her twice. <laughs> and he goes on to say how, like, um, he thought she was 18, but then Grange told him that she was 15, and he was like, ah, oh, shit. Well, he was like, there's no way. You're trying to keep her for yourself, because Molly's going <laughs> to die soon. <laughs> Poor Molly. <laughs> oh, man. After that first sitting, Foster knew Grange was right. The innocent curve of her cheek, the complete honesty in her eyes, her childish inability to sit still for even five minutes, all confirmed Grange's word, no matter what the motive had been in telling him. Foster's conviction was that there would never be a lady in his life as precious as Juliana, left him feeling joyful and despondent. Joyful because, joyful because even if he could never have her, it was wonderful to know she actually existed. <laughs> painfully sorrowfully despondent because he knew there was no way he could ever have her for his wife and it would be unfair ever to let her know how she affected him that's a good thing to think you should keep doing that foster keep doing that because anyway. you are more than twice her age yes 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 yes, yes. um yeah um, they have a boring conversation about eternity, mm -hmm. and um, I don't care about that, but she's basically like, wow, that really helped me. Um, also, his mom died when he was 13. Her dad died when she was 14. We got a lot going on here. Got a lot dying. Um, lots of trauma bonding. Lots of trauma bonding here between the 32-year-old and the 15-year-old. Yeah, and there's a bunch of garbage boringness. So he yells at her, and she's just like, she, and it's comments Wait, like, she couldn't, hmm? He yells at her? Okay, so they're painting, and she kept moving. Ah. Uh -huh. I left, I left out that part. I'm trying, I'm trying to skip ahead as I can. Anyway, basically, this part's really slow. It gets faster as we go, I promise. Because, um, she's, yeah, we'll get there. So, she could never understand, like, the overwhelming tenderness he had for, even though he's yelling at her, it's stupid, anyway. So now she's going for weekly paintings with him. Um, he gets called strange, and so the example that's given him, uh, or that is given to us of how he is strange, is that um, he doesn't like hunting for sport. Ah, uh, not the whole so. being in love with a fifteen-year-old girl thing. That's yeah, that that's kind of what I was thinking. But like, mm, anyway, uh, she's trying to think of him as an older brother because she's found out how old he is now. Because before <laughs> she was like, maybe he's only twenty-five, as if a twenty-five-year-old getting with a fifteen-year-old wouldn't be weird. But I mean, it is less. Weird. Like, when she turned 18, he was, like, 28. I guess that would be slightly... I don't know. Yeah, it would be less problematic, most definitely. <laughs> um, the fact that you can fall in love with a 15-year-old... Because I want you to imagine a 15-year-old. Like, you know, Google a picture of a 15-year-old girl. There's nothing attractive or 
anything. They're just a kid. It's just a kid it's that a you literal, look at, and it's like, oh, a little kid. A literal child who... And, like, what do you even get out of that relationship if you're an adult? Like, you're going to want to talk about your day at work or whatever, and she's going to want to talk about what an asshole her math teacher is. Exactly. It's like, but so far, all they've had are some conversations about death and dying, which is, like, in the time period, that kind of makes sense. And then she's shown interest in art. That's kind of, like, they haven't really shared anything at this point, like... Like there's not, they have nothing in common. Mm -hmm. He's a rich guy that is an artist that's 32, and she's just some poor farm girl at 15. Anyway, so we don't understand why. There's no reason why that they love at first sight. I guess love, love is real. Whatever. Um. So she's going to these weekly things. Um, they're having conversations. It's boring. He talks about how he wants to turn. Well, what the fuck is the name of his thing? Pinedale. Pinedale into a sanctuary for wild animals. Remember that. Also, he wants to have a family. And she's like, oh, sweet. You should, like, totally have a family. And he gets, like, super salty with her and stops talking to her and being, like, a dickhole. So. <clears throat> Don't tell me how to live my life. Oh, fucking kid. Anyway. Um, he tells her to call, her Fost call him Foster. And she's like, uh, no, that wouldn't be, like, appropriate because, you know, you're a lot older than me. <laughs> and he gets salty about that. Um, and then uh, she goes home, whatever. Byron accuses her of mooning over him. But they know that this is about to be her last sitting. So this is probably the last time she's going to see him because he's, like, doing her painting or whatever the fuck. And then she's going to go home and, like, it's done because there's no other reason for her to see him. Um, so on their last one... She's sitting there trying to finish up Jane Eyre before she leaves. And all of a sudden he lets out like, oh, my God. And she's just like, what? Like, what's wrong? And he's like, it just doesn't look like you. And like she goes over there and he's just drawn like a woman. Like, it doesn't look like her at all. He's just he's drawn this woman. And she's like, oh, well, you know, it's really pretty. And um, um, she's like, you know, you should draw Marlene. Like, she's really pretty. Like, you'd get good practice and everything. And he gets really quiet for a second. And all of a sudden, he just hugs her real tight to his chest. And she's just like, uh. Weird. <laughs> and then he's like, um, and she's like, oh, I kind of like this, but also no. And she pushes him away. And he's like, oh, my gosh, will you ever forgive me? And she's like, sure, yeah. Okay, I need to leave now. <laughs> and I'm going to take this. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to take this painting with me. And he's like, no, well, let me put it in a frame. And she's like, I don't know about that. And then and bring it to you next Saturday. She's like, I don't know about that. And then he's like, but I thought you said you forgave me. And it's like, you motherfucker. <laughs> You're the asshole. Anyways, dick. Um, anyway, so she goes home. Henry is pissed off about Foster coming over. He says, says he's poisoning the family. He has uh, bad intentions. And um, um, she says that she's trying to act like the same carefree girl. Which is like, what, did you lose your hugging virginity? Like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't understand. It, it's like, did you not lose your carefree ways? Like, when not everyone you cared about died? Like, that's what I would have thought. Anyway. I mean, being hugged anyway. by a man is pretty, like, weird, but. I, I mean, it seems pretty traumatic to me. <laughs> yeah, but you hate men, so. True. Definitely not an engaged one. Um. Uh, she also talks about how rebellion is festering inside her. And I was like, what are you talking about? Anyway, um, <laughs> Kirk shows up um, and predicts the Great Depression, basically. But just happen <laughs> But just happens that brother, a.k.a. Calvin, is there. And him and Henry are like, fuck off. Leave my little sister alone. We know you have other intentions here. And... Um, and they're like, they look at the painting and they're like, you painted her like a woman. She doesn't even look like a little girl. Like, you need to leave her alone. Weird. And Kirk is like, you y'all need to understand that Julian Juliana is no longer a child. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, brother tells him to leave. And he's just like, you clearly have something against artists. It's like, no, they have something against pedos. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> Um, but anyway, Foster doesn't actually listen to any of this. He keeps coming over, over and over again. Um, and he's basically like, I just want to visit and I'll visit as a friend until she's 18. And it's like, oh, so you want to groom her? <laughs> Weird. <laughs> Clearly. Weird. Um, so for one of these trips, I guess to try and be sneaky, because usually when he comes, they hear his 
his like car or whatever coming so because there's not a lot of cars or whatever and so they hear his car coming and so like henry's there to tell him to fuck off Mm -hmm. but this time he walks the 11 miles (laughs) and he goes up to mama and he's just like let me visit until she's 18 and mama's like bro she's 15 (laughs) you need to chill the fuck out and um he says that juliana is his companion of mind and uh soul whatever that means uh and she's like you still you can come back when she's 18 basically and at the end of the chapter juliana is sent off to go live with brother to protect her from creepy pedo stalker okay so and she's she's pretty upset about that because um she uh she loves being at home she loves her family she loves whatever the fuck cloverdale clover hill or whatever Cloverfield. yeah Clo- i think it's clover hill but um and she's salty about that anyway she goes to live with her brother and um everyone thinks that she's like all sad because of kirk but it's actually really sad because she's not home Mm -hmm. so um don't eat paper i'm sorry (laughs) scouts stop eating paper be like like tofu and eat tape (laughs) all right so one day she's out buying flour she runs into a guy named Jason. Her and Jason on the down low, a little bit dating. But everyone's happy, kind of happy, because it's like... It's um, not someone like th- twice her age? Yeah, it's her age. So everyone's like, oh, cool. That's kind of cool. Um, oh, no. And um, there there are a couple of scenarios where it's like insinuated that Juliana is old for her age. Because like she's super serious about just certain topics. But anyway, I'm not going to go into that. Boring. Anyway. Foster mails her a letter. And everyone's like, how did he get your address? We moved you over here. And brother wants to just rip it up. And she's like, no, I want you to write him a letter back and say, I didn't get to open it. And that you aren't letting me open it or whatever. And brother's like, okay, fine, whatever. Um, Jason hits on Juliana some more. So, you know, they're kind of like a thing going on. Um, Well, they go to Cloverhill for the weekend. And apparently Kirk has just kept coming (laughs) while she's been gone. (laughs) Like, over and over again. And um, finally, uh, he kept asking the mom for her address, Mm -hmm. but she wouldn't give it to him. But guess who did? Byron. Byron gave it to him. Uh, And that's how he got her address. You artsy fuck. You artsy motherfucker. Ah. (laughs) Um, So we keep moving on. Um, Eventually, she comes back home. Henry buys a tractor. Uh, she starts wearing a parasol because she's now she she's got a thing for freaking Jason. Mm-hmm. So she's waiting to get letters from him, and she she writes him a bunch of letters, but she's not ready to send him until like he sends her one. Um, and then he just never gets mentioned ever again. Got- Jason's gone. He's Jason's dead. Okay, cool. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> let's see. <laughs> um, so Richard comes to visit one day, and he brings up the fact. Uh, that Kirk is gone. Kirk is actually in a lot of debt, and also that Kirk currently lives in Florida. Or wait, does she know that yet? Anyway, Kirk moves to Florida. Whatever. So it's kind of and it's insinuated uh, yes. like everyone's like, state. oh well, he got uh, the pedophile state of Florida. Anyway, so he got everyone's like he got married to Maureen and moved to Florida, and she's just like, okay, well that's done at least, right? But she still got like a thing for Jason a little bit. Like she she does mention him one more time, but anyway. Um, Maud dies. I know we're all really sad. Rest in peace. Rest in peace, horse. And they buy a new horse. Did they name it Maud too? John. Oh. <laughs> John the horse. I don't know if they were gonna pull like a Maud Edith kind of thing. <laughs> That'd be funny. <laughs> um, and then, um, someone says that Henry prefers. Uh, prefers horses to people which i'm kind of like yeah like Sus. i think henry's kind of a furry but anyway, so. <laughs> all right sus. so now <laughs> kind of sus yeah because henry's already stated multiple times like i would never get married to a woman because they cause too much trouble blah 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 blah, blah <laughs> right and oh, he's super sad when Maud dies, but it's kind of insinuated because like like that was his dad's horse, and he wasn't there when his dad died because he was off like in the army. So like he's like kind of grieving for his dad at this time or whatever. Anyway, he gets a new horse named John, and um, we're introduced to a new character named Stella. 
And Stella's not important care, to the story. <laughs> but Stella's not really important to the story. But anyway, I just thought I'd mention, this is Juliana's best friend. She gets mentioned over halfway through the book. <laughs> um, we're also introduced to Kurt, the German peddler, um, who apparently people don't like him because of World War I, and he's German. So take that for what you will. And But Mama's still nice to him and buys things off of him because he's a peddler or whatever. So, um, And then Mama, Sister, and Jewel all go to the Davises. So at the Davises, as you remember, who was da- um, Blake? Blake Davis, he was the, um, as he was referred to as a nitwit. He was the mentally disabled man that she referred to earlier. Mm-hmm. And we learn now, they just kind of name drop this, but apparently he has an older sister. Her name is Laura. She's having a baby when they get there. And so Juliana has to cook. So while she's cooking, she's thinking about freaking Kurt. And this is the last time she ever thinks about Jason. <laughs> And she's like, I wonder what they would think about me cake cooking for these people. And then all of a sudden, Blake comes up behind her and grabs her and gives her like a big hug. And she's just like, Blake, let me go. And he does. And um, the baby is born. All right. Cool. <laughs> yep. So there you go. And then um, Henry finds a lady friend named Martha. And then um, and he's flirting with her at the fair or whatever. I don't remember what it was. They're at something. And um, he's flirting with her. But Blake is kind of following Laura around. He's kind of creeping her out, and she thinks he's scary, but everyone's like, he's so harmless. And also, someone calls him a good-for-nothing nitwit, oh, no. <laughs> which is just horrible and mean. Anyway, he's being creepy. So, I wonder what that could mean. So, Byron graduates, and he is valedictorian. Um, and he's heading off to college in North Carolina. Um and then Juliana learns that there's actually a scholarship in town that would pay for her first year of college. And she's decided she wants to go to college. Good for her. So, uh, she's a year, so she, I think she, she must be less than two years because she's a year behind Byron. So at this point, she's 17. And um, she really wants to get the scholarship. Um, but then she's also kind of like, I don't really want to go to college because I'm going to miss home. I was thinking, like, why not just go to one in Georgia? You'll be a lot closer to home. But maybe there's no women's colleges in Georgia. But then it gets brought up later, like, why don't you just go closer to home? And she's just like, no. So anyway, (laughs) she's going to North Carolina, whatever the fuck. That's where she wants to do now. They get a letter from Grange. And I want you to give me a good guess based on the historical circumstances. Is Grange only in this book via letters? No, they were with Grange when they went to see Kirk the first time. Okay. And that's it so far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so he sent them a letter, and I want you to think it's 1921. What's going on in 1921 that he might write about in Georgia? Uh, shit. You're right. The second Klu Klux Klan. The second one? That's what he wrote about. Well, there's like the second, like, phase oh, oh yeah, what are they yeah. called like the second yeah i was like the great depression i was thinking that or maybe like women's suffrage or something like that no we don't get into any of that garbage i see scout is screaming yeah <laughs> oh poor baby she's fine all right we got this we got to get through this book so that we can we can give our reactions to it okay <laughs> um before i run out of disc face <laughs> Yes, before you run out. Klu Klux Klan, it's in town. Um, and they are going after, guess which two groups the Klu Klux, Klu Klux Klan is going after in Georgia. Um, just, just think real hard. People of color and people who defend people of color. <laughs> no. You're wrong. It's Jews and Germans. Ah, uh, wait, Germans. Those are the only. Those are the only two ethnic groups mentioned. No, well, yeah, technically ethnic groups mentioned at all. It they don't say the KKK is going after minorities or immigrants, or they don't say you know minorities, immigrants, and Germ, you know Germans or immigrants, whatever. It doesn't say that. No, Jews. Which makes sense, though not by itself, mm-hmm. because they definitely went after way more than the Jews and also <laughs> Germans. 
Yeah. I Those mean, are the two. <laughs> maybe the Ku Klux Klan did target Germans. Who knows? I don't know. Okay, well, I did try to look it up. I couldn't get, like, a firm understanding. It looks like in the 1800s when Germans were coming over that, like, the first wave of the KKK did go after them. Mm-hmm. They probably did also go after I- any immigrants, yeah. I would imagine. Like, they didn't like Catholics or, like you said, people of color. They didn't like Jewish people and they didn't like immigrants and they didn't like um, people that helped those people. But um, in this book, it said Jew- Jews... And Germans. All right. So, in Georgia. In Georgia. Where we have a very, you know, this is only, what, 50 years after the Civil War or whatever. But, you know, whatever. Anyway, okay. Okay. There's definitely, there's not a single non-white person in this (laughs) book. That's all I have to say. So. I was going to say, are there actually Um, people who would be worried about the KKK in this book? (laughs) Um, so we find out there is. Oh. So, um... (laughs) Um, they'll threaten anyone who takes in a Jew or a German, and um, we already know about Mama. She's always helping those people, and um, also Molly is sick. But who gives a shit about that? They go right over that. No one cares that Molly's sick. <laughs> they completely skip over that. They don't even care. <laughs> anyway, and um, then we switch to like it's like the next day or something. Who knows? Anyway, we switch to Mama's perspective. So <laughs> Mama is in the house by herself, and she's thinking about the following things. She's thinking about how. Juliana isn't going to get that scholarship. <laughs> and even if she did, she can't afford to go to school after year because the scholarship only covers the first year. So after the first year, she's fucked because they don't have enough money. <laughs> so she's like, she doesn't need to go to college. What's she going to use that for anyway? Um, it, a quote I wrote down is, what would she do with coll- a college education anyway? Like, okay, whatever. Let Don't let your child have dreams. <laughs> We also learned that Mama was stopped on the road on the way back from the Davises. Like, she went to go help with the baby or something. And when she came back, she got stopped by the KKK because they heard that she bought vanilla from that German peddler. Um, And so they, like, surrounded her in the street. And they're just like, "Mm -mm mm-mm-mm, don't be doing that. Whatever. So. um, And so she's worried about Juliana because Juliana is supposed to be home by now. And it's almost dark. And she went to Stella's. This is the only other time Stella's brought up. She went to Stella's to go, like, study or something because she wants a scholarship. Anyway, um, we switch back to Juliana's perspective. Um, Miss Shannon, her teacher, thinks she can really do something. And she's, like, really pushing her to apply herself and do well Mm -hmm. and get the scholarship. Um, So she's walking home from Stella's and she gets attacked. Oh, no. Can you guess by whom? Uh, The Ku Klux Klan. No. <laughs> Blake Davis. Oh, no. Anyway, so he um she gets attacked by him. Um and, and and the idea that he was creepy was introduced literally the chapter before. <laughs> so gotcha. keep that in mind. I guess we just need conflict. Anyway, so she's like he 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 so she's walking down the road and he grabs her from behind. And she's just like, oh, and she's like trying to stay calm. And she's like, okay, Blake, come home. Like, we'll make you dinner and everything will be good. And he literally is like, you can't bribe me. Oh. <laughs> and it was like, I thought this man was supposed to be like super mentally disabled. Like, he can barely talk. All of a sudden, he's talking in like complete senses or whatever. Anyway, and he's like, quote, I've been waiting for this and you're not getting away from me anymore. Oh, no. <laughs> so the implication is that Blake is going to rape her. Um, but just in time, a car pulls up and guess who it is? Uh, Foster Kirk. Yeah. Kirk Cameron. <laughs> that is Kirk Cameron. Kirk Cameron's here and he's here to save Christmas. And so, he, <laughs> so this is what he does. He gets out of his car and he punches Blake and then he knocks him into a ditch and then he keeps punching him and then he throws him over the ditch and then he keeps punching him. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And she's like yelling at him like, stop, don't hurt him. And he's like, he takes her home and he, and everyone's like, what are you doing here? And he looks at, and he looks at whatever his name, Henry. And he's like, I'm not the real enemy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Anyway, so the next day they go to Miss Davis's and they learn that Foster Kirk Cook went back and took, um, 
what's his face Blake back there and he's like beat the shit <laughs> he beat the shit out of him and he brought him home and but he never promised not to tell so now Mrs. Davis is worried that that Blake's gonna go to jail um and Julia is like no no I'd never testify against him and I'm just like he tried to rape you <laughs> like yeah like what <laughs> I mean there's okay so it's the 19 19- 20s and so we don't treat mental health well anyway (laughs) but like you know i mean he did try to hurt you like you know anyway so we're just gonna ignore that apparently um and so she brings him in and everything's good with that situation for now (laughs) and so um we cut to the high school there all the senior classes waiting to to learn who the valedictorian is who the salutatorian is and who won the scholarship and it's understood that whoever is the valedictorian is going to get the scholarship basically because that's like been her whole thing it's like i need to be first in my class so i get the scholarship and she's going up against this guy named spike i don't remember his story but apparently he's smart Mm -hmm. anyway so we find out that she's decided she really wants to go to college she really wants to learn more and she really wants to help people and um she's the valedictorian she gets that but she doesn't get the scholarship because it's based on the highest average, let's see, the highest average grade along with the most practical ambitions for her using his or her talents. So basically, they're like, because you're a dude, you get the scholarship because it'd be more useful for you to go to school. Um, this issue isn't addressed at all. She's just kind of bummed she didn't get it. So not a feminist book, not pro-women. Anyway. Um, but she gets to give a speech. He shows up at her graduation, yada, 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 whatever. Oh, yeah, he sends her a necklace. So she's graduated now. She's almost 18. She's like a month from 18. And um, and so he sends her a necklace from Florida. It's got seashells on it because we don't have that down here in Florida. Mm-hmm. That's banned. Banned. Except down where you are. Oh, there's, I've never seen a good shell at Tybee in my whole life. No, they're all smashed into little tiny pieces. Okay, so my brother just told me that his friends are planning to go to Tybee in March. And I'm like, I mean, if you're going to risk getting COVID, like, why would you go to Tybee? Yeah, there's so many it's like the worst. more beaches to go to that are so much better. I'd spend the extra mile and drive down to Brunswick. I mean, I'm never going to Brunswick again, but <laughs> <laughs> other people can go to Brunswick. It's safe for them, so I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, it's like his work friends, so they're kind of like, oh, we all work together anyway. And I'm like, yeah, but like, why would you go to Tybee in the pandemic? Like, if I'm going to risk getting COVID, like, I'm going to go less somewhere less shitty than Tybee. But yeah. Anyway, whatever. Maybe it's just because I lived there for four. You're the one that's lived there for nearly 23 years, so you should be able to give some insight. Surprisingly, for someone who's lived in this part of Georgia for most of my life, I've gone, I've left very seldom. My family doesn't really move around or go places. Um, but I have I mean, been to, you've never been to Tybee? I have been to Tybee. Um, it, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it does suck. Myrtle Beach is better. Myrtle Beach is good, but I have bad memories of Myrtle Beach because that's the only beach we would go to as kids. Mm. So I don't know. I got like some like bad vibes thinking about it. But I feel like if I went by my like if I went now, I'd probably um, be okay with it. The worst beach that I have been to is Jekyll Island. That place sucks. Okay, so see, that's what I was gonna say. So, um, my ex was from Brunswick, and they took me to Jekyll Island, and we had it was right after that hurricane in 2017, mm-hmm. and um, it was actually super cool because no one was there, and the beach was just kind of like littered with like trees and shit, and like so, and it was so it was like really clean, had like gotten rid of all like the garbage and people. It was so pretty. Huh. But see, everyone always talks good about Jekyll, but when I went, it was nasty. Like the water was brown and muddy, and like when you when uh when I when you went in like the water the ground like the bottom of the was just slippery and slimy very gross. So I think the only reason it was nice was because of the hurricane. <laughs> that was like the only reason, but because it was so pretty and like there was literally no one there. At, like, this park we went to. It was so pretty. So, only good memory I have <laughs> of going to um, Brunswick. Otherwise, it's a hellhole. Never go to Brunswick. <laughs> most of Georgia, just avoid most of Georgia. The only places worth going to in Georgia are, like, Atlanta, Savannah, um, 
fucking yeah but savannah is such a fucking tourist trap yeah but i mean it's it's kind of a nice place to go um augusta is nice augusta's eh. i almost got mugged in augusta one time do we have enough time for that story <laughs> uh yeah. it's not an interesting 30, story 30 but <laughs> i've almost been mugged in augusta i've never been almost mugged in savannah but i have spent too much money in savannah the only good thing about savannah is you can drink in public so you can like have your margarita and walk True. down the street so that's, that's why nice. they have that giant yeah. parade there on, on patty's yeah day. i lived down there for four fucking years and i never got to go to pride and i'm fucking salty about it oh i was talking about the saint patrick's day parade but it's pride I don't give a shit about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh man. Okay. So, um. Anyway, Mama is like, "There's something going on," and they find out all the cows have escaped. Right? Mm-hmm. Wait. Oh wait, no, I skipped over some shit. Okay. Well, she doesn't get the scholarship. She's kind of bummed about it, and he sends her a necklace. Henry's pissed about it, but right after this, brother Henry and Richard are like, we're going to help you pay for school. So you need to go. You're really smart, and you just need to go. Like, if you want to go, we're going to help you pay for it. Um, But she's really sad because she doesn't want to le- leave Mama and freaking um, CH is what I wrote. Clover, Canyon, whatever. Anyway, um, he's like, Henry's like, you should go. This is what I've been working all these years for at the farm. So you can go to high school and then you can go to school and do whatever you want to do. You're really smart. Whatever. Um, all the cows get out. Um, we find out that Martha, which is Henry's like chick, she lives at grandma's house. So I'm thinking, so we learned earlier in the book, and I didn't mention this, grandma died. Mm-hmm. But okay, so like, why does Martha and her family live there though? It's never said why or if they just moved there recently. I don't know why. Why did so like if they've always lived in Grandma's house, wouldn't he have noticed Martha sooner? What's going on here? Anyway, this is like the second time Martha's ever mentioned, and she just lives on their property. <laughs> but anyway, whatever. Anyway, um, they're trying to catch the cows, and I got confused about the Grandma house thing. And then guess who shows up? Who? Kirk. <laughs> Fre- freaking Kirk, whatever, Foster again. Kirk. And Aunt D, they show up at, and um, they mentioned Pinedale again, spelled correctly this time, so it was only one mess up. Um, Kirk tries to help with the cows, and he fucks it up because he's stupid. And then um, someone is like, the KKK cut the fence. And um, he Foster starts talking about being a Republican for some reason and wanting to prosecute the KKK people. <laughs> And how important it is to do things legally and by the law. <laughs> for whatever reason. And that he works for the Atlanta Constitution now. Whatever. Anyway. But Juliana, in her mind, is like, it was Blake. Like, why would Blake come and just let your cows out? That doesn't make sense. Because he's mentally disabled, clearly. Although we don't understand what type of disability he has. Other than, we know he doesn't like loud sounds because he didn't like when his sister was giving birth in the living room in front of everybody. I probably wouldn't like that either. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty weird. I mean, they were poor, so whatever. Anyway, um, she thinks it was Blake, and she says he's been through enough trouble, so she doesn't say anything. So, And then I wrote under that, he tried to rape you. But, you know, <laughs> anyway, um, he's clearly doing very not great things this could escalate more i wonder if it will anyway um kirk asks um to marry juliana again um she's 17 at this time now though right well she's like a month from 18 now. okay she that makes so it she okay. leaves so she leaves for school at like the end of august and it's like the end of july now and then she turns 18 august 10th And he's like, he asked to marry her again. And um, so what he's been doing in Florida this whole time is he's been buying land and then clearing it, this forest land. And somehow this is an investment. I want you to remember that. Anyway, Henry is like, no, she's going to college. And Mama's like, well, you can wait until August. And if Juliana decides she wants to marry you, she can because she'll be an adult. She can do whatever the fuck she wants or she can go to college. Um, and then D is a bitch as usual. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. As usual. And, um, as we continue, he's visiting like 
twice a week and no one likes him except for his sister and mama everyone else is like this guy's a fucking pedo i don't want him around my sister and i don't know why you're allowing this because he's clearly trying he's clearly groomed her up until this point he's writing her letters he's doing all this shit anyway um they go to close um also grange is pissed about this he's like i would have never introduced you to him if i'd known this was gonna happen but they end up they end up going to uh cl- not they go to fucking um pine dale or whatever they go to pine dale and foster tells her that he wants to keep his land at pine dale untouched and that he wants to turn it like like i said before he wants to turn it into a sanctuary for wildlife and i can't think of how like so fucking hypocritical because he just spent all this time in Florida fucking up the local wildlife. <laughs> <laughs> but he cares so much and he makes all these comments about like we need to plant more trees for the earth and it's just like what the fuck? You just fucked up the like the ecosystem in Florida. You don't give a shit about that. You need money so you can be a landlord or whatever the fuck. Anyway. I was really mad about it. Anyway. Um uh we learned Juliana doesn't want to have children. Um Understandable. He calls her, yeah, I wouldn't want to either. Um, he calls her little one, which is gross. That is gross. And um, yeah, it's definitely gross. Because uh, at this point, so it's been, uh, she had just turned 15. So it's been three years. So he's 35 now. Um, yeah. And um, Mama says that she thinks he's honest because he waited until she was 18. And I'm like, he didn't actually wait, though, because he kept fucking, like, stalking her and trying to figure out where she lived yeah. and stuff. So, like, he actually really didn't wait. <laughs> yeah. He was harassing her. Anyway, okay. So, okay. Um, she's like, and so she's doing her little inner thought thing again. She doesn't know if she loves him. Does she just love that he loves her? Um, is he is she just something that gets him closer to what he wants because she can give him children and whatever? And um, he, um, let's see. So she's having a conversation with him and she's like, you know, I really want to do something. I really want to help people and I really want to learn. Like, I really want to go to college. And he's like, well, why isn't it good enough for you to just like, I want to, he, he literally is, says something along the lines of like, what, what's wrong with having a dozen children? Isn't that a good enough mission for you? <laughs> and she's oh, just no. like, I don't want to have 12 children. Anyway, she's going to college. She leaves his ass. She goes to North Carolina. She's going to college. Good. Woo. Okay. Going to college. Right. Okay. So, and we switch back to, Fo- okay, I was wrong. We switched to Foster's pers- like, perspective, I think, again, for this one more time. He's worried that she's going to find someone else. He's also worried she's going to change. And so he's talking about how, like, college will change you. You have this spark in you, Juliana. And she's just like, do you really not have that much faith They'll in me? They'll turn you into a Blah, liberal. <laughs> well, he's already a liberal, so... <laughs> Yeah, and they keep mentioning that, and she's just like, I don't understand why he doesn't want me to go to college when, like, he, um, when he's educated himself. Like, he he went to art school in Chicago. So, like, she's like, I don't understand why he doesn't want me to be educated. And I know why. It's because he wants you to be young and impressionable so he can control you, Juliana. So, leave his ass and go to college, which she does. Anyway, we're almost done. And so she goes to college. However, she moves into, I guess, I don't know. She goes to this all girls school Mm -hmm. and she moves into like this. I don't know if it's like dorms or I guess it's like the 1920s versions of dorms. And they have a house mother, whatever the fuck that is. I imagine that's kind of like an RA, but like they're old and decrepit. Um, Yeah. I never had a good RA uh, in college. So I never had an RA. Never lived on campus. true. I had one RA that she didn't really do a whole lot. She was only a year older than us, but she was pretty cool. I was really awkward as a freshman, though, so I she I probably just kind of creeped her out. If you're not an awkward freshman, what are you even doing? You know. Well, well, it was a weird it was a weird situation. We drew Harambe, <laughs> so <laughs> picture it. 2016. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, in dorms how they have those stupid little whiteboards outside your door that you can like. People, like, put things on and you can, like, write on and stuff. So we had one of those and we drew Harambe on it and she kind of got, like, offended. Or she got offended because a bunch of people drew Harambe, but we drew Harambe, like, pretty well (laughs) because, like, me and, like, my freshman roommate were, like, okay at drawing. I don't remember if I drew it or she did. I feel like like Harambe is something I would draw, but I was also a bad influence, so... 
Anyway, so she got offended because um, animal cruelty is bad. And, you know, 23-year-old me agrees with her. I don't think Harambe's funny anymore. But 18-year-old me did. I thought it was funny. <laughs> we all did. What it's was the okay. point of this? Anyway, her name is Lucretia, but everyone calls her the morgue because she wears all black. Also, the water's kind of red and gross because now she lives in the city in North Carolina. Oh, God, the city. Fuck the city. Um... She also has a teacher. The only teacher that gets mentioned is Miss Gerard. So I guess she's not really a professor because she's Miss Gerard, but also she's called a teacher, not a professor. I don't know, whatever. Um, and she is really like pushing. Um, what the fuck's her name? Lucille. Um, shit. What's her name? Juliana. Really pushing Juliana to do well. She's like, you're really smart. You got this. You know French really well. You you should totally do this. Um, Henry and Martha get married. Um, the morgue is anti-love. She's always putting people on restriction. So apparently restriction is basically where you have to like, um, you can't go anywhere, including the library, which seems like a shit deal. You're paying for this and there's just some dumb bitch that can tell you what to do. Anyway, whatever. And, um, we find out that, um, Juliana is, isn't ready for kids, but she would consider it. And then at Christmas, Foster sends her a gold watch, a real gold watch. Um, Brother and Henry are pissed, as they should be, because this man has groomed their younger sister and is trying still to marry her. And then, but Mama believes in love. And she's just like, if they want to be together, they can be together. So he writes her a letter. And it's really gross. So let me find it real quick. Page 187. We're getting really close here. I promise. I promise. I promise. I promise. We're almost out of this. Uh, no, 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 no. We're almost free. <laughs> you all have to experience this pain with me. Okay. Dearest Juliana. Oh, no. I'm going to skip down a little bit. Um, my little girl. Thank you for letting me call you mine, even with reservations. Let us be honest with each other. Our Lord has taught us to be trusting and trustworthy. Let us never break that bond between us. If another light comes into my life, I will certainly let you know. Though I assure you it is not highly although I assure you it is highly unlikely. And you must do the same. I say that with a pain of fear in my chest, yet knowing that if you do not love me, I must accept and then go on living the kind of life that I will not be ashamed of when I meet you in heaven. So I guess if he doesn't get her now, he's gonna fuck her in heaven. <laughs> so Anyway, that just really grossed me out. It really grossed me out because of my little girl. So yeah, I just wanted to make you all experience that too. Disgusting. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> um. So after that, she gets a letter from Mama, and basically in it, they said the pe- the ger- she says this: the German peddler's been killed. Blake Davis was part of the KKK <laughs> that helped kill him. They found him there at the scene. Um. In that. Um, they're trying to help him get a defense attorney. <laughs> He's part of the fucking KKK. And I'm kind of like, at this point, I'm like, I understand. Like, it's really hard to say because it's like he's mentally disabled, but clearly he's not being watched if he got to be part of the KKK. Like, <laughs> can he ride a horse? Is he like, what's going on here? He, all he's done so far is try to rape people and let cows free and fucking kill a man so i don't know anyway um but we find out so we read that letter from her it says that next paragraph it's like it's okay though because it worked out so he was found not guilty by reason of insanity and sent to a state mental hospital for life (laughs) (laughs) oh my god and then (laughs) Yeah, okay. And then all of the other KKK members were found and brought to justice. And then she receives a clipping about of an article about it, and she's reading it. She realizes who wrote it, but freaking Kirk Cameron, oh, Rogers, no. whatever the fuck his name is. So you know he cares about the law. He would be very anti-BLM. Anyway. Well, he is a Republican, so anyway. Um, although the Republicans were switched back then, right? Yeah. Weren't they the more, like progressive party though they weren't really progressive they had a progressive party for that kind of they had the progressive party i don't know and then they had republicans and democrats which were the same thing yeah Yeah. anyway 
Anyway, she's still in school. She He stops writing in March, and she's getting worried. She's like, oh, shit, he finally did go marry Maureen or whatever the fuck her name is. Anyway. Um, um, so Mrs. Gerard notices that she's unhappy. Mm-hmm. And she's like, she's like, you're doing really well. You just need to push through the rest of the semester. And I really think that you're smart enough. You could study abroad. Like, I've never really recommended this to any of my students. And she's like, well, I don't know. And she, I, don't, I don't think I have enough money. And she's like, oh, well, if you can't get a scholarship, I'll pay for you to go <laughs> and study in Paris. She's like, you're really smart. You have this, like, really like strong future ahead of her of you and Juliana's like, "Well, I don't know." And she's like, "I'll think about it." Um, but we actually find out it's cuz Juliana is planning on getting married this summer. So, she goes back to Clover Hill, meets all meet we meet all of our favorite characters again that we haven't seen in a couple chapters, and um she goes to fucking whatever the fuck, Cloverdale Hill, whatever. And he's like, why haven't you been writing me? Have you found some new guy? And she's like, you haven't been writing me. And we find out Aunt D wrote to the morgue and told her to not give her the letters because she was hoping it would break them up. And they're like, oh, Aunt D. <laughs> and then she's like, I, she's like, I love you and I want to spend the rest of my life with you instead of being my own person. And he's like, yay. And then that's the end. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> why are all the books we do just miserable because i do them and i pick them and i pick bad ones <laughs> <laughs> anyway it sucked i hated this book fuck it's just ugh, it's so all over the place like there's so many things that happen for like no reason like what's the point of fucking blake or whatever like like what what did that have to do to add to the story yeah at all i guess it's just and maybe i'm trying to read into it too much like what what did that have to do or what are you trying to say about disabled people and i'm not trying to say that disabled people can't do bad things but this is a book and in books you get to decide how you want to portray people (laughs) so um you also have the um let's see here you also have the knowledge i will let you know that this book is based on her parents and how they met. Oh. Yeah. You so, know, I got to say, this did have a ringing of, like, true story to it because there was just so much shit that happened in it that wouldn't happen if it was a fictional story that was made up because it's just cleaner. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if this is... Yeah. So I want... Yeah, I figured that out by the end of the book <laughs> when it said it. Yeah. So, yeah. So if you go to her books page, and I'm going to pull it up here... And you go down to Juliana, and she's written several books. Um, if you do decide to go to brendanightgram.com forward slash my dash books forward slash, you can see One Brown Cow, which is has the funniest fucking cover I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> it's so good. It's so stunning. And you can also see the cover of Juliana here. And you can see on the cover, like, there's this 80 ass looking dude. He looks like the white guy from Hall and Oates. Like, 100%. And then there's Juliana looking like she's fucking, like, 26 or something in this picture with her fluffy 80s-ass hair. And he's painting her. Anyway, so you can go here to see his picture. And, um, yeah, no, it is based on how her parents met. So, kind of sounds to me like someone trying to, um make a 32 year old falling in love with a 15 year old not creepy because it is and the fact that everyone else also found it creepy makes me feel like it's still creepy so it's not even like one of those things where it can be like oh it was a different time it's like no everyone else still found it creepy (laughs) except for apparently her mother yeah anyway your comments uh (laughs) well um I can't really like there wasn't a lot to say about this book. It's just the way it is. It was pretty disgusting and um It's just so cr- uh! It's just horrible. Bad book. Yeah, no, it sucked. <laughs> and like she basically gets with this older dude who by the time they get together, so it's what? So by that point she's almost nineteen and he's what, seventeen years older than her? right no 
15, he's 32. So so that would be 17 yeah. years, because that's 15 plus 2. So she's almost 19. So by that year, what's 19 plus fucking... Wait, so, okay, okay. 15 plus 4, 32 plus 4 is 36. So he's 36. Yeah. Like, he's almost 40. And she's 19. So, like... It's like dating your fucking dad, dude. It's disgusting. Yeah, there's a there's a quote I skipped in over here because we're running out of time, but, like, he's just like... And she's just like, well, what if I like him? And he's like, yeah, well, you know, um, a relationship is supposed to be a partnership, not a father-daughter relationship. And it's like, I've never thought of him as a father. And it's like, but he calls her things like little one and my little girl. It's just gross. It's gross to begin with. <laughs> but like, ugh. Ugh. I don't like it. This is a not bad, good. bad book. Bad book. It made me unhappy. I didn't like it. And like I said... Our girl Brenda, I don't think she's bad. I don't have anything against Brenda. Actually, she go was, read her blog. She was just go telling the story of how her parents met. Just because her dad is a fucking pedophile doesn't mean Brenda is a bad person. Um. Yeah. So I'm. I think I'm gonna start leaving Goodreads um things on the books I read now. So I'll be leaving my first one on Juliana because there's only one on there, and it's. Un- I am unable to know what understand what it means. So <laughs> it's just like random words strung together, and I'm like, what? Anyway, so but yeah, so uh, I would recommend you don't read this book. Um, maybe go read that one cow. I think was the name. That sounds like a much more wholesome book. Yeah, it's a children's book that she illustrated, so that's kind of cute. I'm also kind of feeling like I need to read. Um, yeah, there's one brown cow. And then her name was Rebecca. That one sounds interesting, too. Sounds like it would be just as bad. (laughs) Yeah, don't read this book. It was very irritating. Um, Would not recommend. Um, Not for my demographic at all. Don't be a pedophile. (laughs) Don't be a pedophile. End of episode. (laughs)